Sometimes the most compassionate thing you can do for someone is tell them the truth. Whether they want to hear it or not. It says the truth will set you free. And, and that, that is true to the certain extent. It's, it's the truth will set you free, but it's not the truth that you know that will set you free. It's the truth that you do, the truth that you walk out in. Because it says that uh, you know, you'll, know, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, I can know how to build a, ro- a, a yacht. And until I put nails in the boards, until I begin to build it, then there's no yacht going to be in place. You can know how to do a lot of things, and until you act out in those things, then, then you're not going to walk in those things. You can know the truth. The truth will set you free. But if you don't act on the truth, then there's no benefit to you. I mean, God can't go beyond and above your will and your desires. And I don't know about you. The enemy's just been attacking right and left, right and left, right and left lately. I don't know about you, but he's been doing that to me, so... Hopefully you guys are all good. But, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is is that uh, he comes to, to bring doubt into our lives of who God is and what he said. You know, we are in a position that we, we look around in the natural, and the natural doesn't look so good, but then we have, we have, when we get to the natural, we, our, our eyes are blinded upon to the spiritual because the natural has blinded us. But this, this world we live in, this is not our world. This is not our place. The things that we see in the world are, are, are not necessarily God's things. He says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free, but the truth is no good unless you walk out in it. A doctor may know how to pull a tooth, but until he pulls a tooth, there's no tooth going to be pulled. Knowledge in itself, there's, there's no freedom in knowledge at all. None at all. No matter how much knowledge you have, there's no freedom in it. The only time that freedom comes is when you take the knowledge that you have and you begin to apply it into action. That's why it says in the Word, without faith it's impossible to please God because you must believe that He is. And He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Part of the problem that we have with compassion and struggles and that we deal with is that is that um, we don't want to stand in agreement with God's Word. I'm just being honest. He says, I'll meet all your needs according to His glorious riches in heaven. He says that whenever you pray, whatever you ask, believe that you received it and it shall be yours. It says in Malachi 3.10, I know it's Old Testament, but it says that uh, uh, test me and try me and prove me in this thing and see if I won't pull you out of blessing that you won't be able to contain. And, and God keeps saying over and over and over in his word that I want to bless you, 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 but you've got to believe that I want to bless you. And the problem is, is we don't feel like we deserve to be blessed. I'm serious. Well, I'm just an old poor sinner, and I'm just going to just die and go, and just this whole world's terrible to me. Well, shut up, please. Thank you. You know, you, you desire uh, what you desire, but your desires are never going to come to, place, plan, pa, uh, to pass until you begin to walk out in some of those things. God says, he says, I'll give you the desires of your heart. Right? He said that, right? I didn't say that. He said it. And what did he mean by that? He means that he wants to bless you with the desires of your heart. He says he wants us to live a life that's abundant and full. I want to leave you, give you an abundant life. An abundant life is not a life of lack. It's not a, 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 a life of just getting by. God wants to bless you more than you ever thought about being blessed. And, and whenever the enemy comes and he starts banging on you and, and, and just hitting you in the head and, and just trying to tear you down, know that you're on the right path. Know that you're doing the things that God's called you to do and, and that the enemy, although he may come, he has no authority in your life. The only authority that the enemy has in your life is the authority that you allow him to have. You know, the Word of God says that the, the enemy is under our feet. He can't get in your face as long as you stay on his head. The minute that he's in your face, it means you move. 
Ephesians 6 says that having done all to stand, then just stand. In other words, and that, and that really means is, is to stand on the Word of God, stand on His promises, and believe that what He says is true. And expect those things to come to pass. We walk in a world that we feel guilty if we're successful sometimes, especially in the church world. We've got to be martyrs. Well, God don't want everybody to be rich. Well, then if that, He doesn't want everybody to be rich, then He must want everybody to be poor. I mean, is, is that not the opposite? He says, I've, I've anointed them that their eyes would be opened and to open up blind eyes, that their ears would be opened, that they could hear. Everything that he that said that Jesus was anointed for was to reverse the struggles and the diseases and the sickness in people's life. And the last thing he says, and to preach gospel to the poor. Now, if everything he said prior to that means to reverse blindness, reverse sickness, reverse deafness, then why does he say preach the gospel to the poor? Because he's desiring you to reverse poverty. We walk in a poverty mentality in the church. We're afraid to let go of something because God wants to bless you so much if we would just let go and trust God. But yet we don't trust him. We don't deserve we don't think we deserve God's goodness. We don't think we deserve God's blessings. We don't think we deserve a, a peaceful life. We don't think we deserve a life of love. We don't think we deserve all these things. Well, that's a lie from the enemy. Jesus says, I come that you might have what? Life. And life to the full. What he was saying, I come because you deserve life. And the life that I give mine is so that you can live and you deserve it. And you need to walk out in it and believe it and receive it. Because my son shed his blood for you. How dare you walk around and say, I'm poor, pitiful, and God doesn't love me. He loved you so much that he gave his only son. But yet when it comes to the natural things that we want to, we want to, we feel like it's, well, you know, if, 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 if they really love the Lord, they wouldn't, you know, buy that new Mercedes. Well, if God blessed them to buy a new Mercedes, let them buy a new Mercedes. You know, poor people ain't never give a person a job. I don't know if you knew that. And God desires for us to walk in wealth. How can we bless other people and bless the church when we walk in a mentality of poverty and think that it's wrong for us to be blessed? Listen, God wants to bless us so much. We just got to get it wrapped around our heads that we deserve it, not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Come that you have life and life to the full. And yes, we will go through struggles and trials and temptations in our life, and there'll be down times, but that's not God's desire. Sometimes we have to walk through the valley to get to the mountain, and sometimes the times of walking is a place of resting and waiting and God redirecting us in the right path the way He wants us to go. Because it says in the Word of God in Romans, all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord, for those that are called according to his purpose. And all things mean all things. And that means no matter where you're at, whatever your circumstance, whatever your situation is right now, that falls under all things category. And the promise of God as a believer is that it's going to work together for your good. And it's real easy to get down in the mouth and, get, and struggle because you know, it's just like the, the, the demons of hell have just released a, an army against you and you just don't know sometimes which way to turn, which way to go, whatever. And, 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 and then you get start agreeing with the enemy. Yeah, I'm a pitiful person. I don't deserve nothing good. I really want that job, but I don't deserve it. I'm not good enough. See, the enemy comes and, and, and lies to us. The one thing we have to do, and this is not necessarily in my notes and stuff like that, but you have to walk into an attitude of gratitude, and you've heard that over and over again. But when we wake up in the morning, you have to get into a place that you, you are grateful to God that you're alive. You're grateful to God for everything that we have and that we do and the, and the blessing we walk in. We need to thank God and be grateful for the people that are surrounded us, for the place that he's put us. Because anything less than that is saying that God's not able. God's not good enough. 
And that if God really loved me, this wouldn't happen. God really does love you, and this did happen. And you can get in one of two places. It, it, there's no really other place you can get. You can get either get in agreement with God's word, where two agree is touching anything, it shall be done. You can stand in agreement with that and walk in that and walk in peace and love and prosperity and all the blessings that God has for Or you can get in agreement with the enemy. And most of us find ourselves, I even find myself sometimes, getting in that position that I want to get in agreement with the enemy. That says, if you was really, uh, you know, a, a good pastor, things would be this way. Oh, yeah, I'm a terrible pastor. If you were really a good person, this person wouldn't go through this. Well, yeah, I know I'm a terrible person. If I really did things right, then this thing wouldn't be happening to me or my family. Yeah, I'm a terrible parent. But see, you can get into that place, and you can stand there, and, and God says, where two agree is touching anything, it shall be done for them. Sometimes you're in agreement, you and God are the only two in agreement. But that's two. Two in agreement. But guess what? That is a universal truth where two agree is touching anything, it shall be done for them, which means you can stand in agreement with the enemy and you'll receive it. He says, you're terrible, you're nothing, you're, you're, you're no good for anything. Nothing good ever is going to happen in your life. Things are going to die and, and things around me are, are just falling to pieces. And hey, yeah, boy, things are bad. Well, that, that may be the truth of the matter that things are bad, but you don't have to stand in agreement with those things. Listen, it says in Revelation that God opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors that no man can open. And, and then you've got to decide whether you're going to, you've got to walk through a door or, or, or not touch a door. A lot of us got to shut a door and we want to keep knocking and try to rip it open to go through it. And we wonder why we're in struggling. But when God shuts a door, then he's another door somewhere that's open. You've got to find it. That's really been the only way I've been able to do, hopefully, what God's called me to do over the years, especially after my accident, because I didn't know how to do anything other than, than I'll, I'll walk through this door until this door opens or shuts. If it shuts, I'm going to leave it alone. If it opens, I'm going to walk through it. That's his word. God opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors that no man can open. But you've got to be in the place that you realize that, that God loves you and he shed his uh, son's life for you that you could walk through those doors and not only that that you deserve to walk through those doors again not out of who you are or any great thing that you've done because nothing you've done is great but it's out of what jesus christ did if we could get a hold into our minds of of what god desires for us he says um he will and this is paraphrasing that God will produce the fruits of your lips. I mean, literally. So if ever that was, we took it to actually be the actual truth that God says, I will produce the fruits of your lips. And you say, boy, I'd give my right arm to have that car. And your arm fell off. <laughs> Would you offer your left one too? And, and that's the literalness of God. If you, if, if you say, you know, God, I'm never going to get out of this situation, then guess what? You're never going to get out of this situation. He creates the fruits of your lips. And guess what? He doesn't say what type of fruit. He says he will create the fruits of your lips, whether it be good fruit or bad fruit. The same thing with an agreement. There are some universal laws that cannot be broken that have nothing to do with your faith, your Christianity. It's just the way the world was made, the way God threw it into existence when it says that whatever you sow, you're going to reap. It don't matter if you're saved. It doesn't matter if you're the richest man in the world, you're the poorest man in the world, whether you're the biggest heathen in the world or you're the greatest saint. Those are universal laws that I just believe cannot be broken. And when we find ourselves walking in the, in, in, in the, in the, the struggles of those or seeing the, the payback on that, then, then it's not, listen, it's not God that's doing, the, the deal is, is you've broken a universal law that God put into place. If you're going to sow hate and anger, you're going to receive it. I know this is bad, but, you know, um, 
I saw a thing on YouTube. It's called Instant Karma. And I know that's a new age word, but, you know, it, it means that you're going to, you know, what you sow, you're going to reap instantly is basically what it means. And I've seen people in this, this instant karma that people do stupid things and it just, bam, slides back on them. Like a guy kicking a ball trying to hit somebody, it hits the wall and comes back and hits him in the head and knocks him out. You know? I saw a guy riding on a bicycle and he was going to try to grab a lady's uh, purse and he loses control of it and wipes out. <laughs> and I'm like, cool. You see a bully picking on a little guy because he's a little scrawny guy and just, you know, trying to punk him and stuff like that. And all of this little scrawny guy is just like, man, you know, just leave me alone. The next thing you know, he lifts up his foot and kicks him in the head and knocks him out. That's a universal law that, that we can't overcome. I think that where to agree is touching anything is a universal law that goes beyond just Christianity. That God had put in place that if you're going to agree with somebody in the same, then, then, then it's going to happen. Remember the, the story of the Tower of Babel? What, what did God say? He said, you know, we can do away with this because there's really not anything that they cannot do if they set their mind to it. What are we saying? If there's a, a place of agreement that they set their mind to, there's nothing impossible for them. Then why are we as believers, if there's nothing impossible for us, through the Word of God when He says so many things like, I'll meet your needs. Whenever you pray, whatever you ask, believe it, you receive it. Uh, I want to give you the desires of your heart. That I want you to be the head and not the tail. That I want you to be blessed and not cursed. That, that, and, and, and He says those things over and over again, and, and, and we don't believe it. Listen, the enemy will come and try to steal your joy and steal your peace and steal your, your relationship with God, but he is just a liar. You can either choose what the Word of God says and stand on that, or you can choose what the Word of some Fred the drunk says and believe that. You have a choice of how your life will play out. And here's the thing. Sometimes bad things happen. Like that. <laughs> In left field, yeah. Running around, screaming. That sounds like my house on most days. So, but, uh, but I reject that in Jesus' name. <laughs> but the thing of it is, is, that, is, is that, that, w that we can choose the life that we live. When you wake up in the morning, you know, some people say, well, he, you know, he can't control his anger or whatever like that. Uh, yes, you can. And it's not so much as now because now we have, uh, what do you call that when you look at your phone to see what? Uh, boy, uh, caller ID, you can choose whether to open the phone, open the phone or not. But whenever we had the dial phone, so you had to pick it up. You could be in an argument with your husband or your wife or your kids and screaming your head off and the phone would ring and you'd say, hello. <laughs> but you say, well, they don't have any control. Yeah, they do. Everybody has control of your circumstance and your situation. You can choose to walk in it or not walk in it. The choice is yours. And just because uh, bad things happen doesn't mean God has abandoned you or he doesn't love you. It just means that stuff happens. The Bible clarifies that by saying it rains on the just and the unjust. It means you can be holy as holy and it's going to rain on you. And you can be big as a sinner and it's going to rain on you. But when the rain falls, you're going to get wet. It's not a big thing, that, a conspiracy that God has to try to make your life miserable. But what it is, is just it falls under the things that things happen. But we have a choice of how we can walk out in those things that are happening. Jesus desired, he had compassion for people. And whenever we get to the place of compassion, we can walk out in the love and the benefits of God and the blessings of God. I say this almost every week, and I guess I keep saying it because I hope everybody's going to get it, is that they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? They said, love God with all your heart, with all your mind and all your spirit. What's the second one? Love, the Lord, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, in these two all the prophecies, everything that's ever been written in this book, everything that God has done 
lies in these two things. If you can get these two things right, then everything else is going to be right. He didn't say to change the way you live. He didn't say, and which, which, please understand that. I'm not saying you can live whatever you want to do. Refer back to the first part of the message is whenever you sow, you reap. You know, that's like I saw one where the guy was whipping the horse, trying to get him to go, and the horse kicked him in the head. God had nothing to do with that. <laughs> it was, he sowed that, and that's what he reaped. You can sow things and you'll reap bad things. But God desires good things for you. He wants you to live in the goodness and the fullness and abundance. But God had compassion, and everywhere he had compassion, he brought healing. He said, if you can get two things right in this world, love God, love your neighbor, everything else will fall into place. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. Especially when the enemy comes and he's daily knocking on your door and and keep reminding you how terrible and how wor worthless you are. You've got to you've got to rebuke that. You can't be useless. What did I say? Ruth, useless. What well, useless? Useless. I got rented lips today. I bought them at Walmart on the Black Day at Friday sale. Anyway, uh, but uh, you know, he reminds you, you you're useless. But but the Word of God says that I've given you the right. Through Christ to be called the sons of God. An heir with God equal with Christ. The complete sequel equally with Christ an inheritance from God. So if, if God is saying, listen, you've been called a kingdom of priests and, 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 and I've given you right to be called the sons of God, the daughters of God, then, then how can when the enemy comes says you're worthless or useless, how can you stand in agreement with that? If you do, you're going against what God's Word says. Just the same way if someone gets sick and you pray for them to heal, well, I don't believe God wants to heal everybody. Well, you don't know if you want God to, to should, if God want to heal them? Well, I don't know. Well, if God doesn't want to heal them, let's just do what God wants. You think if God don't want to heal them, he must want to kill them. Right? I mean, seriously. Well, God don't heal everybody. Well, Okay, well, then let's the guy pray that God kills everybody. You can't have it both ways and say that God is a God of love and God is a God of healing, and then we're not supposed to pray for healing because God may not want you to be healed. If God don't want you to be healed, what does he want you to do? I mean, what we should do, and I've met people that have said, well, you know, God, it's, it's God's will, it's in his hands, and he, he must just not want to heal me. I said, well, let's go ahead and pray for his will. What's that? Let's pray that you die now. That's the end result, right? I mean, that's the, that's the crazy thoughts we get, and we try to make ourselves feel like we're so spiritual that we just, oh, it's so great. God just doesn't want to heal us all, and, and, and he's just a floating God out there that just doesn't have any uh, authority and just doesn't want to do anything, although he said it, and we just don't want to believe it. But either, why did Jesus say whenever he left uh, uh, the disciples and said, here's some things I want you to do. He said, and these were commands that he gave before he left. He said, heal the sick. He didn't say, ask them if they believe that God wants to heal them. He didn't say, go ask him, say, I don't know if God wants to heal you. He may want to kill you, but I'm not sure. So we'll just pray that God does whatever he wants to do. You don't understand God's word. He come that we might have what? The McFly. That we might have life and life to the abundant, full life. God desires that we walk out in that. And we want to be martyrs and say, oh, God doesn't love me. This is, you know, if he, if he loved me, I wouldn't walk through this. There isn't the reason he is loving you because you are, he loves you. And the reason you're, you're dealing with it is you're walking through this because God's going to take you another place. Another universal law, I think, that's in, in, that's in the world is that uh, no pain, no gain. And if you're sick, you need surgery, you're going to have to go to the pain before you get better. If you're uh, portly and uh, you want to not be portly, it's going to take some pain. You're going to have to do some workout. You're going to have to move away from the table. You're going to have to push the Oreos away. 
And now they this season, they've got those double stuff with the red in them, and they taste just as good as the regular Oreos. The reason they're red is because it's from Satan. <laughs> that's, that's why. Eating those things. They eat a whole bag of them. Let's look at, at God's desire. Number one, he has desires that we have compassion for one another. And compassion is just, listen, I want you to get to the place that God wants you to be. I want you to live a life that's full and complete. And I want you to realize that, that uh, listen, God didn't make you to be a, a horse's rear end. You chose that all on yourself. I'm just telling you. I don't know if you believe that. But it's really true. It's your choice. Well, I couldn't control myself. Yes, you could. You're just, you're just, duh. You ain't got it. Yes, you have control over your life, over the things you do, over the things you say, over the actions you take. And so, well, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Yes, you knew what you were doing. Please, come on, McFly. We all know what we're doing. But we get into the place of denial and say, oh, you know, I just just No, you knew what you're doing. You acted out in it because you wanted to walk out in the flesh, not walk out in the spirit. And so what you sow, you're going to reap. That law is in place. And I hate to tell you, that's just a true law, and there's nothing you can do to get around it. I can't change it. God can't change it. It's not going to be changed. It's put in, in space and place. But the one thing you can do is you can walk in the place that, that no matter what you're going through and struggling, as uh, Luke's been reminding me every week, day this week, is that God's had him in Ephesians that says that whatever, having everything done to stand, just stand. And it don't mean just to stand there like a knot on the log. It means to stand there in the faith that God's word is true and that God loves you and he's not going to turn his back on you in your time of need. Well, I don't deserve it. Yes, you do. How dare we say that we don't, want, we don't deserve the blessings of God whenever he sent his son Jesus Christ to die that you might walk in the blessings of God. Most of us don't even know what the blessings of God are. We don't know what the covenant of God is. When he says, I want to bless you above measure. I want to bless you more than anybody else. I want you to be blessed above every nation. I want you to be blessed above everybody else. I want everything you touch to, to prosper and grow. I want your vats to overflow. I want your corn to overflow. He talks about everything that he talks about in the, in the, in the covenant of Abraham was a blessing of growth in every aspect of their life, including, not limited to, their financial things. He says, your barns are going to be overflowed. Your vats are going to overflow. You're going to have no barren among you. He says, I will take away the evil diseases of Egypt. And everything he says, and, and he says, and, and, and your fields will prosper, your animals prosper, that they're going to, and you keep going over, he keeps talking about all these things, and those things were the money. They were the money things in the world. That, that, that he talks about the Abraham, he says, these are things that how you survive. You have cows, you sell the cows. I'm going to bless your cows so you have more cows than you can sell. What does that mean? It means you have finances. I want us to get into the place that we, we want to quit being so spiritual and say, well, God doesn't want me to be rich. Well, maybe he does. Maybe he wants you to have more than enough so you can bless some people that don't have more than enough, and then you can teach people that don't have more than enough how to get more than enough. This is kind of teaching a lot of people. Maybe that's why we're small today, because a lot of people will choke on this. And they'll say, boy, he's just like old Joel Osteen. He's one of them prosperity preachers. I am a prosperity preacher because I can't find anywhere in God's Word where he says he wants you to be non-prosperous, where he wants you to be broke and homeless. And I can't find it. Well, that's okay to clap. It's pretty good teaching. Oh. So, so why do we get into that place? It, it's just, it doesn't bring God glory when you're broke. It doesn't bring God glory when I have two broke-down cars in the, in, the, in the driveway at the church. That's getting ready to change. Amen. That's right. Because I'm going to take him to Gordon's. <laughs> I'm going to send them right where they need to go. And God's going to bless me. God, listen... 
God's goodness is so great. But here's the thing about it. Even, even though they are brought down, I, don't, listen, I thank God that I got what I got. The beginning of the blessing comes to the place that you thank God for what you have and what your situation is and where you're at right now. You've got to walk out with an attitude of gratitude because if you don't, you're going to live a miserable life the rest of your life. Well, I don't have anything. Well, uh, yeah, you may not have anything, but you had a warm place to sleep last night, probably. Probably had food. I haven't seen too many people going hungry in this place, Eli. And so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the truth of the matter is is that, 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 that we are so our mind is so messed up because we don't understand what prosperity is 90% of the world lives in poverty 90% of the people don't have a home to live in around, around the world about 70% of them don't even have clean water to drink. Or toilets. India, we think it's a great place. Yeah, yeah. there's no hardly a sewage system there, so there's feces all over the ground. I mean, it's, it's just, and, 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 and we think we, we have it tough. No, we're just not grateful. We're not grateful. I'm grateful for every day of my life. I'm grateful for what God has done. I'm grateful for this place. Yeah. And I could say a real spiritual thing like, but we don't deserve it. Yes, we do deserve it. The reason we deserve it because this is a place where God uh, touches people and changes lives, and, and God deserves it, and we deserve it because we can't do it without it. But we've got to get rid of stinking thinking in our lives. And the compassion says that. And I'm going to close with this right here. I'm going to hit a few scriptures and, and, and then we'll be done. Matthew 9, 13 says, But go and learn what this means. In Matthew 9, 13, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous but the sinners. He has compassion on us that, are, that struggle. Matthew 7, 12, 7 says this, But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent. We wouldn't condemn the innocent, but yet we get an attitude when we see somebody begging. And, 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 the, and, the, and the real spiritual people will say, well, I don't think I should give them money because they might go buy beer with it. Well, Lord, if they need a beer, buy them one. I mean, they don't shoot me for that. I know I'm going to catch a lot for that. But what I'm saying is, is God didn't say, you determine what they're going to do with the gift. He says, you give the gift. That's your obligation. It's not your obligation to sit and judge them of whether you should give them the gift or not the gift. Whatever they do with it. Here's the thing of it is, is people don't realize that. If God calls you to give, you give. And what they do with it's up to them. That's right. But you're going to get the blessing anyway. You're going to get the blessing no matter if they go get sloppy drunk and fall off a bridge. You're going to get the blessing because you did what God said to do to give. Now, having said that, there's a difference between that and then enabling someone. Don't enable people. You can't do that because that puts you in a sin position too. Matthew 14, 14 says this, And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he felt compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Because the blessing of God is, is, is compassion and healing the sick. If he didn't want us healed, he wouldn't have healed the sick. He would have said, you're not sick enough yet. Matthew 15, 32 says, And Jesus called his disciples to him, and he said, I feel compassion for these people because they've, they've remained here with me now three days, and they've had nothing to eat. And the disciples said, well, let's just let them go to the city and get some stuff. He says, no. 
I don't want to send them away hungry, but they might faint on the way. He had compassion. He, he, he didn't want them to faint on the way. And then Matthew 20, 34 says, He moved with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. Everything that we see about Jesus and the compassion was not something that brought disaster into their life. It was something that brought a blessing and healing into their life every time and every day. So if you're dealing with some stuff, it's not God that's brought it into your life. And you need to quit blaming him for your situation. And quit agreeing with the enemy. I'm never going to have anything. You're exactly right. You're not. God doesn't love me. Yeah, that's exactly right. You don't. I'm never going to get ahead. That's true. Your heart's never going to get ahead. I'm going to stay broke the rest of my life. Absolutely. Where two agree is touching anything, it'll be done for them. If you want your life to change, you've got to change your thought process. You've got to change how you feel about things. You need to repent. Some of you are like, oh man, that was cold. No, you need to repent. And here's the problem when I say that, that it messes up some of y'all because you don't know what the word repent means. It means to change the way you think about a situation. Get rid of your stinking thinking. That's right, Terry. Repentance is nothing more than it. Well, I think, I think you know, I, I'm just a poor sinner and I'm going to hell. Well, you need to change the way you think about that because Jesus went to the cross for you. And when you gave your life to him, that you got to need to change the way you think about that. If you think that God doesn't want to bless you, you need to repent about that because it goes against everything in God's Word. It goes against everything that God teaches. From Genesis to Revelation, there's nothing but blessing, 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 blessing. You say, but pastor, there's some Old Testament curses in there. Well, we're not under the Old Testament anymore. We're under a new covenant. And under the new covenant, Jesus said, uh, if you love me, keep my commands. The commands he said meant was the ones that he told him. He says, love God, love your neighbor. That's the commands. What about the curses of the Old Testament? Well, they had to shed blood. They had to kill an animal to get set free. Well, what changes that for us today? Because Jesus went to the cross and was murdered and his blood was shed for us so that we might be set free. He became the perfect sacrifice for us. So how dare you think that whenever you call Jesus in the name of Jesus and he comes into your life that he's going to abandon you because you act like a fool? Please understand this, and, 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 and people don't understand when I talk this way, but people get this impression i say well i can live however i want to because pastor says i'm still going to go to heaven well you know what that has some manner of truth to it but the problem with that is you can live however you want to but you're going to get to heaven a lot quicker and you cannot overcome the law of reciprocity that sounds like i was drinking on <laughs> sound like otis reciprocity <laughs> Reciprocity. Did I say that right? Reciprocity. Reciprocity. Thank you. Another Walmart word. So anyway, you, you can't overcome that. You just can't overcome it. But the truth of the matter is, is God loves you, and he wants the best for you, and he desires the best for you. And maybe you're here today, and you've just been down in the, in the mully groves. I've been there. I've been there a lot. I always return back to what does God say about this situation? He says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Nothing can separate you from my love. Not peril, not famine, not anything. Guess what? Sin cannot separate you from God's love. Having said that, don't mean you should go out and sin and put God to the test. But once you receive Christ, he said he died. He took all of our sins and they were nailed upon the cross. And then whenever he said he can't do it, we're just saying that his blood wasn't good enough. His sacrifice wasn't good enough. If anybody tells you you must be saved and 
you need to stop them because there's nothing after and. You must be born again. You must call on the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. And if you walk in the Spirit and it says the Spirit of God will come upon you and live within you, then your life will change because you won't act the same way because the Spirit is built inside of you and it's a red light that goes off when you start walking in the wrong direction. God doesn't want you to walk in the wrong direction. But He's not going to all of a sudden, just because you make a mistake, slap you in the head with a big stick and knock you out dead. God doesn't work like that. He loves you. Every head bowed and every eyes closed. Maybe you're here today and it's just this, this message just spoke to me. Maybe it reignited some faith inside of you that, to realize that, you know, I have been letting the enemy come in. I have been speaking and agreeing with him that, that uh, that's not God's will and, and I want to stand on, on God's plan and and stand with his word, which says that he wants to bless me. That, that he will help me get through the, this situation. That he will get me to the other side. That he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He loves us with an everlasting love. That he will meet all of our needs. And he'll give us the desires of our heart. God's a faithful God. That's why it says, without faith, it's impossible to please him because you must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Father, speak to people's hearts right now, Father. Lord, help us repent. Help us change the way we think about things. Knowing that you are great and merciful and loving and no evil thing will you put upon us. You're not evil, nor will you tempt any of us with evil. It's impossible. We bow at your feet, Lord, thanking you for your sacrifice. And we're going to, every one of us, Lord, just help us walk out of here today with the attitude of gratitude that we just thank God, thank you for this day. Thank you for, for the, the sun that rises. Thank you for the people in my life. Thank you for for just every time. I'm grateful for what you're doing in my life because it comes from you. I want to pray with you right now and you just pray what you're at. And I just want to pray for some just peace in your life. Father, I just pray that right now as you stand in agreement with me, Father, I pray that, that the enemy's lies will have no more effect in their life. Lord, I thank you that your word in you, it says you are yes and amen. It says that the, the Lord can't be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anyone with evil. Father, we receive your word. It says you desire for us to have life and life to the full. And Lord, we commit our lives whole and completely to you right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, not about the things that we do, but it's about what he did for us. And I want to receive that payment, that blessing right now, that gift that you gave me of your son into my life. And where I'm struggling, Lord, I just need that joy replaced in my life. I want to, 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 to get my mind back in the place of, of thinking on the good things. If there's anything good, think on these things, Father. And Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Touch each and every one of us right now that, that as we walk out of this place, we know that God loves us so much and he has desires of greatness for us. He has desires of love for us and peace for us and desires for change where the enemies come, Father. Lord, we just thank you that the, that the, the enemy has to pay back whatever he's stolen. Whether it's joy, peace, health, love, a person, or whatever. Lord, we sick you on the enemy right now. Lord, you rebuke the enemy in our lives. In Jesus' name. And Lord, thank you for loving us.